House of Dudley is a story of three generations of a scandalous Tudor family known as the Dudleys. Each generation gets very close to the throne and each generation ends up on the block. It's a story about their ambitions, the love that they have for each other and for others, their plots and machinations, uh, and the rumors that abound about them. It's completely researched in the archives. I was able to even uncover some material that hasn't really been used to tell their story. Um, but it's also told in a way that is as much like a fiction novel as, as I could. Um, so there's, there's, there's dialogue, there's description. Um, and so it's meant to be uh, a page turner. <laughs> and so I hope everyone enjoys it. Edmund Dudley is where uh, my book starts um, and it's certainly where this part of, of the Dudley story begins. Edmund was the elder son of a younger son of a baron. He was trained as a lawyer. Um, so he was a gentleman, but a very, very low and little standing. Uh, he studied a sort of niche topic in the law, which was um, the king's rights and prerogatives. Um, and had some academic success, uh, some slight sort of local political success. He held some offices in London and the like, but he, he certainly wasn't on track to be anyone that we would talk about 500 years later, except it turned out that Henry VII needed someone at exactly that moment who was well-versed in the King's rights and prerogatives. Um, through some family connections, Edmund Dudley's name was put forward. And so he ended up uh, being brought before the king, made Speaker of the House of Commons, and very soon uh, opened his account book uh, for the king, collecting revenue for the king. Um, and so it was this sort of um, odd coming together of, of Henry VII's need with Edmund Dudley's uh, abilities. And it's it's thanks to Edmund Dudley that that the family was, was known at all, that, that it had those close uh, connections to the throne. Um, and that it has its reputation as well, um, because of course Epson and Dudley um, is is taught even school children today. You no, know, ooh, you know they're they're those sort of conniving, corrupt ministers. Um, and uh, Edmund, of course, was executed for treason. He's the first of our three generations to end up on the block. I think really all of the rumor that surrounded the Dudley family that made me really interested in uncovering as much as I could who they really were. There's this sense that you get if you're reading, for instance, the, the pamphlet, Lester's Commonwealth, which this book begins with, that this family was cultivating treason <laughs> um, in its children. There's a there's sense that they were reading Machiavelli bedside and they, they talk about it being a, a tribe of traitors and, and that especially Robert Dudley, who the pamphlet is about, was raised in order to try to overthrow the crown. And they've been trying to do that for generations. And, you know, I certainly didn't take that at face value reading that pamphlet, but Every family has a culture, and I wanted to know what the culture of this family was, because regardless of the truth of, of this sort of black legend of the Dudley family, obviously something was going on with them when three generations rose so high and then ended up on the scaffold. So it was that curiosity, I think, that really made me want to explore them further. I think it's difficult to pinpoint precisely what made the Dudleys, I guess, tick, <laughs> what made them so ambitious, what made them fight so hard and fall so hard. But I think there is certainly a sense when you look at the sources and you spend a lot of time, well, almost with them, um, with the family through the sources, that they were very self-aware of their family as a family. Um, this the, the title of the book, The House of Dudley, is referred to in, in the letters. Robert Dudley refers to the, his house, the House of Dudley. Um, there's a sense in which his sister brings up her son, who isn't even a Dudley, he's a S Sydney, Philip Sydney, as a Dudley. 
and Philip Sidney talks about himself as a Dudley and his the legacy that he has to carry as a Dudley um, and how seriously he takes that. So there's this real sense of the family as a family that needs to be a family that needs to be protected and that needs to hold a certain place in the world. So that's one thing. I would say the other thing that I found really motivated a lot of the uh, figures in the Dudley family was was fear, was a fear of, of death, of disappearing, of, of being not important, of being pushed out, being irrelevant. And so there's a sense in which they were pursuing a certain position in order to have a sort of longevity and security, even though ironically, in pursuing all of that, they ended up on the scaffold, they ended up destroying the family essentially at, at, at various points. And then of course the family, basically withers into nothing. So there's, a, there's an interesting irony in that, I think. Robert ends up uh, as master of the horse for Elizabeth I. As soon as she comes to the throne, he's one of the very, very first to get the letter from William Cecil sent out on behalf of Elizabeth I that she's coming to the throne and, and, and that she's gathering uh, her court around her. So from the very, very beginning has this very close personal relationship with the queen, as well as this close physical proximity because master of the horse rides behind the queen, um, goes out hunting with her, etc. cetera. Um, and about a year or two into the start of her reign, there start to be rumors <laughs> that uh, Elizabeth, of course, she's being courted by most of the princes, the eligible princes of Europe, um, but that there might be uh, someone at home um, who is also uh, a potential suitor for Elizabeth, and that's that's Robert Dudley. And their rela their relationship, although um, they never they never do marry, um, or or at least we're never aware that they marry. There's always there's always conspiracy theories and rumors and all that. Um, though they never uh, they never appear to marry, um, they have a very very close relationship as well as a very tumultuous one. Robert is thrown out of the court a handful of times, um, ends up in disgrace quite often, um, but always manages um, to get back into the queen's favor. You can almost think about it as as. Um, this moving between and this shifting between crown and scaffold <laughs> um, that we see over the generations, the Dudleys um, find themselves uh, caught uh, really between these two these two forces. Um, and so, I my book covers um, three generations, sort of a fourth in the epilogue, and every single one of those generations gets very very close to the throne and ends up on the scaffold. Um, and it just seems this odd repetition almost until you look deeper and understand a little bit of why it, it keeps happening in that way and why certain members of the House of Dudley um, don't end up on the block, such as Robert, Earl of Leicester. You're sort of listening as a historian um, at, at open doors and keyholes and, and, and the like to, to see what you can pick up, especially in that period, because it is just a period that is swirling with rumor. And a lot of those rumors are Robert's own doing. Um, he, he was a sort of, um, the, the, the pamphlet Lester's Commonwealth uh, talks, about, talks about him as a sort of master of shadows. <laughs> um, and you can really see that once you start delving into the period. Um, certainly, uh, many of the ambassadors thought it was a sure thing. He, uh, he would definitely marry the queen. Um, at various points, they thought that he had. Um, and that you get them writing to their masters saying, you know, a secret marriage has taken place. Um, the Arguably, the moment uh, where it's clear that it isn't going to happen uh, happens fairly early on in 1560, um, when his wife dies in mysterious circumstances. Uh, for many, that's seen as the end of his suit. Um, but of course, the, the rumors persist long after that. Um, it's four years later that he becomes Earl of Leicester. Um, they re remain very, very close. And of course, the Kenilworth celebrations in the 1570s um, so coming up on two decades later, 
um, are often still seen as Robert's attempt to sway the queen into marrying him. Um, so, so there are moments where it seems like it's definitely going to happen. But of course, Queen Elizabeth is, is the master of, of delay um, and of prevarication. So it's always difficult to, to read her. And, and the, you see that in the ambassadors, they can't figure it out either. <laughs> is something very um, fearful about the the culture of the court. Um, uh, I, I talk about in the book as, as a snake pit, um, people issuing insults like um, hisses from a bow, you know, that, that, that idea that um, everyone is sort of out to get each other a little bit um, and that uh, rumor is one of the most important and valuable weapons in the battles of the court. And Robert manages, I think, to survive because he's very good at, at managing that um, and ensuring that he is the one planting the rumors. He is not the victim of them. Um, but certainly he, you can see he's quite scared at various points, especially when it appears he's losing the queen's favor, um, when he thinks he might be accused of murdering his wife um, and the effects that that's going to have. Um, he's very, very aware that distance from the queen and from the court could mean death. Um, and so in those moments um, when he is out of favor or when he, he might fall out of favor, you, you, can, you can tell that that um, terrifies him a, a little bit. And, and you can feel there's this sort of desperation to get back into, into power or into favor and thus into power. Um, but he's usually very, very smart about how he goes about doing that. And that desperation doesn't necessarily mean that it, it doesn't compromise his tactics. Um, so for instance, um, one of the moments where he's, he's most out of favor with the queen is when he accepts um, the governorship of uh, the United Provinces of the Netherlands, um, largely because no letters were, were crossing um, between England and the Netherlands. And so he, he had to make a decision and that was the decision he made. Um, possibly also because he really wanted to. <laughs> it, was, it was quite a, a, a significant position, um, but it ends up, massively uh, royally <laughs> peeving off the queen. Um, and even his brother says, you're, you're better off in the farthest place in Christendom than ever coming back here. Um, and so Robert's in a very, very difficult position. He sends um, one of his, his men to go and plead with Elizabeth. That goes very badly, doesn't, doesn't result in anything. And so um, he ends up sending someone else, um, uh, one of the Shirley brothers, who are also very good at, at, at rumors um, and things, who does two things. One, uh, he, he tells Elizabeth that Robert's very, very sick, <laughs> might even be dying. And, and could, could she please in all her you know, mercy and benevolence send her doctor? And so she's very emotionally affected by this. I suspect she sees through it a little bit as a ruse as well, because um, immediately shuts down any um, talk of, of, of forgiving him but she sends her doctor and, and is concerned and the other thing is um that Shirley throws well and Robert as well throws that first person entirely under the bus um they they tell Elizabeth and 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 Robert even though Robert knows of course that he Davison had done everything right um, he tells them off in a letter too, saying, well, you're the one who convinced me to do this. You tell the queen that it was all your doing. Shirley tells the queen that it was all Davison's doing. And so they essentially find this scapegoat um, in Davison, who was really just trying to do his best for Robert Dudley. Um, and so with this sort of two pronged attack of Robert's illness and, and betraying his, his own man, um, Robert gets back into favor. It's no wonder that people think that they're Machiavellian and um, corrupt and sort of soulless, um, because these are the tactics that Robert's willing to use in order to maintain his position. Mm -hmm. 
So in the course of researching the House of Dudley, I was able to have a look at some letters that although they've um, been looked at by archivists and historians in the past, haven't really been used as a way to understand this family and the members of this family in the same way. Um, so uh, particularly letters that um, talked about their motivations, um, their reflections on politics, um, wills and inventories that really uh, got to the heart of what this family was, was like, what their home life was, um, and really the connections and the networks that, that they uh, were working so hard to establish. Um, and so by bringing all of these sources together, I think at least I was able to tell a very rich story about a group of people who have often been painted as the villains of history. That was one of, I think, the most in some ways challenging, but also exciting parts of working on the House of Dudley was recovering the women's stories and the women's voices in this family. And what I found is that you actually cannot understand this family at all without looking at the women in it. And their successes are really based on the work of the women in the family. Whereas of course the failures are often the men. <laughs> um, and you get the sense in which with each generation falling and ending up on the scaffold, the women pick up the pieces um, and really put it back into a position where uh, it's, it's close to power once again. And so for instance, um, Edmund's uh, second wife, um, uh, Elizabeth Gray brings um, really a, not only um, a vast amount of wealth into the family, um, but title as well. Um, it's through her that the Dudleys are able to um, claim links um, to, uh, for instance, um, uh, the Viscount Lyle, um, and um, that, that, that's where that inheritance comes from. And after Edmund Dudley's fall, um, she marries the uh, bastard uncle of uh, Henry VIII. And so immediately the Dudley family is, is right back in those close circles of power once again, and that's all down to her. Uh, John's wife, Jane, uh, Jane Guilford, later um, Jane Dudley, Duchess of Northumberland, uh, after John falls, ends up on the block, um, her, her son Guilford um, ends up on the block. Um, Jane is, is very committed to restoring her remaining sons. Um, she makes attempts to appeal to uh, Mary the I and to the women around her. Um, she forms connections in the court of Philip II once he becomes king consort, and her will is, is filled with, with presents and appeals um, to some of these connections that she, made, she has made. And her son's pardon is dated to the day of her death. So it's very, very clear that she is the one who, who has redeemed them. And I think it's also her that teaches Robert Dudley, in a sense, how to survive in the court, um, because she... Um, and her daughters work incredibly hard building those networks and those connections, which ultimately restore the Dudley family. Um, and it's, uh, as I said earlier, Robert Dudley is, is a sort of master of rumor, but his sister, Mary Sidney, is right along with him in that. And there's a great moment uh, that I was able to recover from the sources where Mary Sidney is sitting down um, with uh, some of the, the most important ambassadors in the Elizabethan court and telling them absolute nonsense, <laughs> um, reassuring them about, yes, definitely the queen is going to marry the archduke. And well, you know, women, um, you know, they have to appear coy, but you know, she's definitely into it and all of this stuff. And they're just eating out of the palm of her hand. And it's, it's, it's all part of, of what, um, Robert and Mary are doing in the court at the time, which is, is manipulating people's beliefs about what's really going on. And, and she's incredibly essential to that, um, but I think gets overlooked. So I, it was a mission of mine from the beginning to recover the family as a whole family and not just tell the story of, of three separate men, but show the connections between those men, the, the legacy of, of treason 
generationally, but also the whole family in terms of, of the women, um, that other half of the family, which tends to go ignored. So if this was going to be, um, you know, a TV miniseries or, or something. Yeah, so I've cast most of the House of Dudley in my head. Um, I'm not going to lie. Um, it's, I, I, I think you kind of can't, can't help but do that. Um, and so I've, I've gone big with that. There's, there's no point in, in doing otherwise. Um, so I think, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch would make a fantastic Edmund Dudley. He's right in that sort of, you know, Sherlock, Dr. Strange kind of, <laughs> um, kind of zone. So that would be great. Um, I think you'd have to have two castings for John Dudley because he starts off quite young and then um, goes through his life. So, um, of course, um, the wonderful uh, Timothy Chamolet would be fantastic as, as a young John Dudley. Um, and then uh, that leaves Tom Hiddleston to pick up the role somewhere, you know, somewhere in between. Um, and then I'd love, I'd love, love, love Charlie Cox to uh, be Robert Dudley. Um, I think uh, there's, um, oh, there was that film that he um, was in sort of historical dress for, um, and it suits him so well. <laughs> and you'll notice I've cast all the men. I haven't cast the women, um, which <laughs> may say something about my particular interests. Um, but yeah, let's, let's go big or go home. House of Dudley ends at about the same time and for the same reason as the House of Tudor, um, lacking heirs. So despite the fact that Robert Dudley's uh, parents had some 13 children, um, by the time Robert is coming towards the end of his life, uh, there's only two brothers, uh, he and Ambrose, um, out of originally eight brothers. Um, and then there's um, two sisters, um, Catherine, who has no children, and then Mary, who does have several, um, but they're Sydneys. Um, they're not they're not Dudleys as much as Philip Sidney will say he's a Dudley, and of course he dies before Robert does. Um, so there are no heirs. Robert um, waits a long time before remarrying, largely because he doesn't want to lose the Queen's favor. Does marry in secret um, the Queen's cousin, uh, Latisse Knowles. Um, but they only have one child who, who dies um, before he's three years old. So, and Ambrose has no children. So there are no heirs to the house of Dudley. And so when um, Robert Dudley dies in 1588, um, shortly after the defeat of the Spanish Armada, and then Ambrose dies two years later, um, that, that essentially is, is, is the end. Except it also isn't a little bit. And so in the epilogue, I talk about um, the three Roberts who, um, compete uh, for the, the, the legacy, the inheritance of the House of Dudley, um, particularly Robert Dudley's bastard son, also named Robert Dudley, um, who ends up uh, running off with his cousin um, to Italy, lives in Florence, um, declares himself to be the Duke of Northumberland, um, tries to get both uh, James I and Charles I to recognize him as heir to the House of Dudley. Um, ends up dying abroad, um, but his first wife uh, becomes Duchess Dudley <laughs> um, and, and, and she's really the last of them and she dies in the late 17th century. So there is this sort of coda to it all, um, but it, like the House of Tudor, um, they just, they, they essentially run out of heirs. However, we are still talking about them, right? one of the ways of overcoming death in the 16th century was through fame. And that I think they did. <laughs>